I will turn it over to Car Karin Se Tang, the Policy and Alliance Director of Californians for Justice to lead our next panel. Thanks, Natalie. Hey, good to see a lot of folks here in this, in this space. Um, I wanna uh, just thanks to the folks joining this panel today on transformation to racially just community schools and whole child supports. Uh, like Natalie said, my name is Karn Sutang. I'm the Policy and Alliance Director at California for Justice. Pronouns he, him, his. Uh, first off, just wanted to share my appreciations for the AP team for putting this together. Uh, thank you to all the folks joining the water cooler and of course our brilliant panelists uh, that I get to share space with today. Um, I'm excited for this panel, y'all. Uh, I wore a shirt with buttons, I did my hair, I wore pants for some reason. Um, and I'm ready to talk about community schools. We know a lot of folks in this space have been organizing and fighting for racially just, relationship-centered, uh, whole child support, school transformation for decades. And we know transformation requires bold visions, long-term commitment, long-term investment. And you can't just like check off a bunch of boxes and boom, your school is transformed. Um, and I know I see community schools as a vehicle to get us closest to that vision, kind of like a down payment towards transformative schools. And as folks may or may not know, we won hella money for community schools this year, $3 billion. Um, and advocates, students, families, educators are right now engaged in strategic planning conversations with CDE as implementation continues. And I know for me, uh, I'm here not just because AP told me there'd be free food at this event, uh, and I can't believe I fell for that again. Uh, but I'm here because I care about community schools. It's important to me, and I know it's something that all our panelists care really deeply about. Um, so our panelists today will dive into a conversation around important lessons and takeaways that can ensure an equitable rollout of state grants and guidance and a supported environment for districts to either start or continue community school efforts through an ongoing process that is led by meaningful students and community engagement and partnership at every level of decision-making. Uh, and with that, I'm honored to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first off, we have uh, Leslie Hu, who is in her seventh year as a community schools coordinator at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Academic Middle School in San Francisco. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Lamont Snare, who is a parent leader at Oakland High School, his involvement to community schools blended his commitment to racial justice organizing with trying to create racially just school environments. Eduardo Ruiz, who is an alum from Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School and a youth member alum from Inner City Struggle in SoCal. Uh, and Steve Zimmer, who is the Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction for the Superintendent's Initiatives Office with the California Department of Education. Uh, so thank you to all the panelists uh, for joining today. And we're going to start off uh, with an opening question for all our panelists. Um, and maybe we can go in the order of the folks that I just introduced in that order too. Um, the opening question, California invested a historic $3 billion into community schools and hold child supports this year. As we know, community schools have proven to address the needs of students and families when they are developed with an authentic community engagement and collective decision-making process. You've all been invited to this panel because you have been a part of community schools implementation or have witnessed the positive impact of, transformation, of transformative racially just community schools. Can you share a little bit about yourselves and your role with community schools and how has community schools been an impact in your life? So maybe we can start out with Leslie. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Leslie. I am in my seventh year as a community school coordinator. And I actually left my role as a school social worker. I was a school social worker for eight years doing direct service and managing all of the social emotional supports for a school. When I just kind of out along the way, I just really realized that like what I really wanted was to actually be part of a team that was transforming the entire educational experience for young people. And I couldn't do that as a direct service provider 
um, or as a school social worker. And so I did a lot of research and I, you know, on community schools and I landed this gig and I'm a believer y'all like this is the way that we need to be doing school when we're centering young people, centering families and understanding that young people are not just a student that identity is not just a thing it's also they're a son they're a daughter they're a cousin they're they're in a faith community whatever those identities are and if we don't attune to all of those identities and we don't provide robust rigorous equitable anti-racist pedagogy along with the supports that they need to be successful then we're not going to be able to go anywhere with our young people and so i just really believe um, that community schools has the impact that it can't that that our young people need and there is growing data I mean this is kind of a newer thing and so I know that there's not as much data out there um, as you know literacy interventions for example but I've seen it firsthand and I'm really excited to kind of dig deeper a little bit about my own experience and the experience that I've seen out in the field thanks Leslie Lamont you are next up all right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so for me, um, as someone who worked at a community school, a dual immersion community school for about 15 years running a community schools program, um, I was fortunate enough to find a community school, dual immersion community school for my son um, going into kindergarten. Um, and my experience, um, you know, both working and participating as a parent at a community school has really, you know, made me believe in this model as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll speak a lot about in terms of my experience is the experience of uh, starting uh, Oakland Soul, uh, Oakland School of Language, a middle school um, in Oakland Unified School District, along with Faith in Action, um, East Bay, and parents and communities, and especially students as young as third and fourth grade in, on our design team. Um, and so that's the, the experience that I'll uh, speak to. Um, and that school has now uh, merged with Frick Impact Academy in Oakland um, to continue the work as a dual immersion community school. Thanks a lot. Eduardo, you are next. So hi everyone, my name is Eduardo Reese. Uh, right now I'm currently a freshman at Cal State LA. You know, I recently graduated from uh, Mendez High School. And I, I was previously involved in an inner city struggle. You know, I advocated for a lot of propositions and a lot of new uh, le legislation that will hopefully help my community and give students, you know, more equitable access to different types of things. And, you know, in terms of how a community school has really helped me was that Mendez really they really cared about the students and you could really tell, especially like during the pandemic, you know, a lot of students, you know, went through a lot of, you know, psychological and emotional problems. I knew a couple of students that unfortunately lost some people, you know, they, they really needed a space to feel, to, to process like all of these different emotions they were going through. So we were able to organize like um, sessions during Zoom where we could have like a safe space so students could talk about what's happening in their lives. And hopefully, you know, some of the faculty who are involved in our sessions, they could provide them with advice and just comfort, you know, learning how to, how to go through these, this tough time. And we've also organized some food drives for some families that were really you know, struggling because of the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of food insecurity. People were having trouble, you know, getting paychecks. They didn't have enough money. And it was a really tough time. And, and families are still going through this right now. But, you know, we're still offering a lot of the services. You know, we give them also, you know, a lot of, a lot of types of, you know, foods like, uh, we also give them utilities, you know, such as napkins or bottled water or toilet paper. You know, that was that was a really big problem when that was happening. And we've also held like activities for students to socialize. Because you know, during the pandemic, we couldn't see each other. 
you know, students, they like they forgot how to talk to each other. You know, it's just it was it was tough. So like sometimes we held Zoom sessions where, you know, students could play play games with each other, you know, like on their phones or sometimes like they could just talk about whatever they want, you know, as long as it's, it's appropriate. But, but yeah, they could socialize, do do what they what they choose. And also, I know a lot of families didn't have access to, uh, in terms of finances, they needed a lot of assistance since jobs were cut back at the time. So thankfully, you know, Mendez was able to give us, give the students some gift cards, you know, like $200, $500, you know, whatever, whatever is necessary, whatever, whatever could help them. And, you know, that could be used for food, that could be used for rent. And, uh, you know, thankfully, at that time, we had the pause on the mortgage payments. So you know, there was help here and there going our way. And lastly, we also gave them like technical support, you know, because a lot of students didn't have computers, didn't have hotspots. And sometimes if we did have those things, you know, sometimes the Wi-Fi just wasn't working. You know, we had problems connecting to the Internet and, you know, it was it was tough, but our, my school was there and they helped. So, you know, I really appreciate what my school has done. Thanks, Eduardo. Thanks for holding it down for the young folks today too in this panel. Um, and then Steve, you want to round us out for the opening question? Thank you, Karin, and, and and thank you, Eduardo, for for all that you did, um, really um, saving lives uh, during during the pandemic. And and I know also through inner city struggle, uh, addressing the disparities. You know that that the intentional disparities with which COVID ravaged our, our communities. So, so thank you. Um, and I think that that's a, um, and also just th thank you, Karn. Um, thank you to Advancement Project for highlighting, for highlighting this at the, at, at, at the water cooler, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on this, this panel. Um, and really um, in different ways, shapes or, and forms, I've been working on community schools for about for about 30 years um, as a young teacher, um, you know, looking a lot different than I look today. I, I think a group of us realized very, very, very early on that, you know, that that the the inequitable power distribution in schools was not healthy, and and we were not embracing and welcoming um, all of our students, especially students who. Um, we're struggling through through trauma and struggling, you know. And as we know about trauma, sometimes that comes out in behaviors. And and we noticed that there was a lot more exclusion. There was a lot more pushing out than embracing and welcoming in. And you know, kind of by accident and without a lot of support, we began to build partnerships. You know, you know, with 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 folks in the community who really we welcomed on to our campus to say how can we work together to support our families to support our students and you know it 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 was as, as Eduardo so eloquently pointed out it 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 wasn't like you know highly necessarily highly researched you know this approach that approach that you know therapeutic perspective or that you know it was about listening and, and, and figuring out like what folks need right now in the moment and being present and being there. And, you know, over the years, um, I was very blessed to just be able to work with um, in solidarity with a lot of folks really trying to rethink what, what, what education has to mean, uh, particularly in Los Angeles. If we are to you know, ever get to the type of outcomes for students and families who have, have dealt with the worst effects of both the direct and institutionalized racism in our system. And so to do that, we had to really rethink what schools could be. And the community schools movement is the embodiment of that, of, of both thought and action. Uh, as Karen pointed out, 
the three billion dollar investment by the legislature and, and, and by the administration is not a gift from you know the the quote unquote leaders of California. It was a victory won by organizing and advocacy on the ground. And I think we at you know Superintendent Thurman, myself, the folks who are working on the you know basically kind of the program that will um, you know that that will actualize the the promise of community schools statewide. We really do look at this as a transformational model, not just providing services as important as that is, but really about changing relationships at school site, changing the balance of power, changing really how, what students and families experience and what the community experiences as it relates to our public schools. And so it is, you know, definitely about about making sure that the foundations of support are wrapped around students and families, but also that every, every adult who works at that school is a listener and a learner along with our students and, and their families. Not that we have some wisdom or brilliance that we're gonna go impart onto you or that we can fix a problem that is not, you know, is not maybe we perceive it as a problem, but is really just the reality of, 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 of years of disparities, right? And so it's not our job necessarily to assume that we know how to fix things, but rather to listen and, and learn together in solidarity um, to make the kind of changes both at schools and in communities that are so urgently needed. Thanks, Steve. I know a lot of folks are excited to take these collective steps together. Um, so next, we're going to dive deeper into community schools. We're going to ask uh, each panelist a set of questions. And to start us off, uh, we're going to start with the folks who are most impacted by schools, obviously, and that is students. Uh, so Eduardo, you're going to be leading us off. Uh, the first question for you, you are a product of a racially just community school in LA. How did your community school support you and your learning? And how was your community school responsive to your needs? Yeah, well, and thank you for that question that, yeah, as you know, I was involved in an inner city struggle for a while. You know, we, we were really pushing people, um, especially to, to start filling out the census, because unfortunately, in, in many communities, they don't know what that is. You know, sometimes they have this fear that, uh, you know, if I fill it out, you know, what are they going to do with that information? You know, but, you know, it was... It, it was a really tough time, as I mentioned before, in the pandemic, that uh, there were there was a lot of uh, people struggling, you know, mentally and emotionally, and we were able to give them those resources where in Zoom sessions, they could talk about their problems, anything happening in their lives. And, you know, really, when everything like started shutting down, you know, some people, they couldn't go to therapy anymore. Some people didn't have access to that also. Another really important thing is that, you know, we, we never had access to, to psychological care at schools, which has, it's a really important thing because that really impacts how a student performs. You know, if students don't know how to manage their, their problems, you know, their stresses or situations happening in their lives, they, they'll have a tough time doing the, the assignments, you know, getting involved or doing this and that. And yeah, like I noted before, we, we organized many food drives for families. We provided them with food resources that they need because, you know, there was, it was, it was a tough time and there was no employment there was really bad food insecurity at the time. And, you know, our school had to take matters into their own hands because, you know, there were problems happening within the government on how that should be allocated, this and that. And not that much action was taken at the time. So you know, I really give props to my, my school for doing that. They reached out, they gave them the support and the help. 
and they they just really really demonstrated that they care especially the teachers because you know we also had problems of having the money for resources for buying supplies you know a lot a lot of teachers go you know go out of the norm and they sometimes they purchase um, we've had a couple of teachers that purchase some of the workbooks that unfortunately our school wasn't able to afford you know and they just just went they used their paycheck and they provided these these students with what they need because you know they think that and they believe that you know what's more important is educating the young people. You know that's a that's a value that everybody holds holds really dear to. And you know just just with all with everything that my community school has done, I really hope that other districts could do the same, other schools could do the same. And, you know it's really important that we get more access to to funds, so we could do that. Thank you for sharing that, Eduardo. Um, and now that there is, you know, a lot, a lot of money on the table for community schools, where now schools could possibly uh, start doing that as well. How do you envision being a partner with the California Department of Education to adopt a framework that centers students and student values? And the second part of that question: How can students continue to support the movement towards transformative? racially just community schools in partnership with the California Department of Education? So, yeah, you know, it's, it's really amazing about the new generation of students is that just like, you know, what happened during, throughout history in the United States, you know, people stood up to injustices, you know, like in the 1960s with the civil rights movement with other movements that has been happening. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing to see that more is being taken now. You know, a lot, a lot more people are getting that courage to speak out. You know, especially some of the students at Mendez, you know, uh, uh, not, not a lot of people know about this, but we recently uh, advocated to construct the new student health center. So what I mentioned before about having access to medical care, mental, mental health, and also dental. So that, that's going to start to be available for, for, for the whole community. They'll have access to that. And just it's a free, free thing. And in the past, what I've, what I've done also in the past is give student testimonies. We really wanted to put pressure on the district to provide more AP courses or elective courses. And that's something, you know, a lot of people need to take into consideration that, that a lot of schools don't, don't have a wide, wider variety of courses to select. You know, sometimes we're just given the basic A through G things, but if you expose students to different types of subjects, you know, there, there's no telling what their, what their ambition is gonna be in the future. You know, if you expose people, them to new things, they're gonna want to pick up on those things. And what what also we've managed to succeed in, and I hope other other districts start doing the same, is we remove police from our schools, because I sincerely believe you know, uh, the students don't have to feel incriminated. You know, they don't have to feel like they're indifferent from other people just because of the way they look. You know, the things happen everywhere and it's, you know, it's really prejudice just to believe it's gonna happen mostly in certain areas, you know, cause that's a, that happens anywhere. So like we were able to remove police from the schools, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, with uh, what unfortunately was happening at that time we we conducted some surveys during that time because we also wanted to understand if students are on board with this, you know, that they support what's happening. And knowing that most of them are, we, we also wanted to guarantee any different types of opinions and for all of us to have a compromise and a consensus that this is what we want to do, you know. And also we, we were able to form some partnerships with different organizations, such as uh, the Geffen Playhouse, 
So, this, so some of you are aware of that, you know, where we give students the opportunity to see people act, you know, to act, we, they play roles from the different famous novels. And just being able to like see, you know, students get excited for that. Because, you know, sometimes when it was when uh, people get older, they start saying, oh, you know, poetry or like novels is boring. No, when you expose them to those things and you make it interesting, they're going to do it. You know, they're going to find it interesting. And also in terms of like sports or after school programs, we, we also advocate for more equipment, you know, more resources, such as more personnel, because it's nice to have guest speakers where people are able to discuss these things. So yeah, those are some of the things that we've started advocating for and hopefully other districts will do it too. Thanks Eduardo, thanks for sharing that as well. Um, we're gonna move on to our next, uh, next panelist, Leslie. The first question for you, how has your role as a community schools coordinator led to the success of authentic community schools what are some values you want to make sure other districts adopt as they implement their own community school? Thanks for the question, Karn. I think one of the things that I, I always like to lead off with is sort of context setting and the potential of what community schools can actually bring to school communities. And I want to say that like within two years, we were able to increase students um, math and English language arts scores by 9% outpacing the rest of San Francisco Unified School District by 7%, right? And so that happened in less than two years of us officially adopting the community school strategy. And I want to be really intentional about that. I say that with their, with intention because we are it at schools, right? Like I'm not interested in kind of rethink, like talking about the wraparound services. We all know how important those things are, but we're in the business of educating young people and helping them grow intellectually, right? How do we engage their brains to utilize these critical thinking skills, right? And so everything that we do is geared towards instruction and growing them as human beings, right? And so, and within the one year, we were able to decrease um, our office disciplinary referrals and suspensions by 90%. We had the highest rate of office disciplinary referrals and suspensions in our entire school district. And we were able to decrease it by 90% in one year, um, utilizing, you know, we, we did a lot of things, but this was the first year of our county school strategy. And we're very intentional about that, right? So I really wanna be intentional about sort of like what community schools and the potential impact that we can have on young people just by those two data points, right? Um, and I, I want to kind of be the, bring it out even more around sort of what are the values, what are the intentional things that we believe in, and that changes our mindset, and that's the mindset that we use to drive everything we do. Um, I think the most important thing as a community school coordinator is I have to be in a space of listening 95% of the time, right? I have to not only listen, but I have to create the conditions and systems and structures in my school community for everybody else to listen to young people and families, right? We don't, active listening is not necessarily a skill that a lot of us um, inherently have. And so how do we actually pivot our entire school community so that we listen and then therefore center our young people and our families in the way that we do school, right? Um, so we, we lead with equity and anti-racism. Um, I firmly believe that when we center our Black children, our Black families, um, our Brown, um, Indigenous, um, Pacific Islander, all of these groups of people that have historically been oppressed, that's how we grow. That's how public education gets furthered and advances and grows. Um, and how do we actually, this is more important now than ever, is like, how do we actually be healing centered in everything that we do? It's not just about having like a peace station in the corner, um, but actually, how do we actually do that instruction? How do we maneuver and move through our spaces that are healing centered at all times, not just about a peace corner um, in a classroom? Um, how do we actually encourage adult collaboration? Um, so I have um, been in school communities where adults don't talk to each other. They don't collaborate. Um, and that's just not how we're going to move young people um, and to, to have them reach their potential, right? Um, and so we, at my school, we create like these, in, in, these systems where adults are working with each other. 
where we collaborate with each other, where we talk about vertical alignment in math and the scope and sequence, where we talk about um, how do we actually all the teachers come together to support little Johnny in this classroom. Um, and then how do we actually sit in a space of learning? How do we actually sit in a space of humility and always sitting in a place of like, we as educators, we as uh, service providers, we are always listening and learning to the people that we are trying to serve, right? Um, and also how do we be intentional about data? How do we be intentional about creating the systems and structures for us to, to gather that really important information to inform how we do this work, right? We can't begin to even think about the things that we're doing if we don't have information to lead us to get there. Um, and so those are sort of like the really big picture um, ideas that we as at MLK Middle School in San Francisco are really, really intentional about. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and next question is coming to you, Lamont. Um, I know you shared a bit in the opening question, but can you share a bit more? How have parents led the movement towards transformative racially just community schools? And how do you envision to continue to support the movement as California adopts a framework and vision for community schools? So thank you, Karen. Um, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it all boils down to the sharing of power at schools, right? How the school leadership partner with parents and students to co-create school culture? Um, how do you make sure that the conditions for teaching and learning includes dignity for all who are involved, right? Um, when we developed Oakland, school, Oakland Soul, um, we had twice monthly meetings with students, parents, teachers, school leaders, talking about what a day at school might look like. Um, students literally got to draw you know, what they wanted their school to look like, what the playground should look like, what the play structure should look like. Um, you know, uh, the design team um, allowed for parents, um, including myself, to decide on the academic approaches like expeditionary learning, right? Um, as well as co-design uh, and create the curriculum for advisory. Um, our design team, which again included students, you know, as, as young as third grade, um, also collaborated on the hiring of the staff at the school, right? We came up with the questions that were in the interview process. We interviewed teachers and, uh, and principals and co-decided on who those folks should be um, that would come into our school. And you know, one of the things that it really helped with in, in the development of the school was the community that was built through all of those processes, working together, um, you know, even and especially across languages. There are people that, you know, I, I'm not a Spanish speaker, um, but there are parents that, you know, I was able to build relationship with you know, across the language barrier. You know, thankfully my son who, you know, has attended dual immersion schools all his life, um, speaks Spanish fluently. And that, you know, for a black boy walking in and around Oakland and Richmond, like that's that's unheard of, you know, when we walk past the pupusa stands and I make him speak in Spanish to the people, like they really appreciate that. But it also helps to build community you know, for us in the communities that we, we um, have lived in. Um, so I think that those are some of the ways, um, you know, that parents have led um, and that I consider, you know, as we develop uh, a framework and a vision for community schools. Thank you, Lamont. And while we have you, I see two questions in the chat from Angelica. Angelica, we will come back to your first question, but um, for the second question, Lamont, and again, you kind of touched on it, but if you want to expand a bit more, if there's anything else you want to share, with the demands on our public schools and limited resources, including limited time in a day, what have you found to be the most effective to encourage adult collaboration and collective healing? Well, I think, you know, many of the panelists have hit on this, right, this idea of listening. Um, and again, this is where I go back to power, right? Um, Community schools, you know, there, there's something in that name, community, right? Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, and I've worked on campuses, 
run after school programs and been a part of that stigma that, oh, that's those people over there. You know, they do they do child care or they do these things, right? Whereby the the folks in power, the, the leadership and teachers, and it's not to, to, you know, take them down in any way, shape or form, but there's this idea that they're the experts. Um, and I think that we all have to value the expertise of every individual that steps foot onto a campus, whether they are a student, you know, a, a parent, um, you know, a community member. Um, I think, you know, uh, Leslie talked about, you know, uh, racial equity and valuing certain populations who have been oppressed. There are, there are experiences, you know, that, that I've dealt with as a Black man walking on campus, you know, just off the top, the assumption is, what are you doing here, right, um, before people get to know me, instead of, you know, how can we help you, how can we work with you, right, um, as a staff person, as a Black man on a campus, I was what I called the resident Black man, if any Black parents came to the school upset about something, the focus was on their behavior and not what they were upset about. When, you know, I sat in meetings talking about what was going on with their kids and knew that everyone was aware of how this child was being mistreated. And yet the response was, let's call the police because this person is out of control. And I think those are some of the things that we have to do, that we have to deal with um, you know, in, in thinking about how we deal with community healing. And the last thing I'll say to that is this idea of cultural humility. At, at Oakland Soul, that was one of our values, right? And it's the idea that everyone on campus is, you know, examining what they bring into the school community. And that includes especially the adults. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a value that I think we really have to deal with you know, obviously in our society, but in our schools, when they are the place, you know, that are um, responsible for developing kids. And that can either be a very positive experience for students, or it could be a very negative experience, which, you know, all too often tends to be the case for a lot of our, you know, kids of color. Um, I also want to piggyback Lamont on what you're saying too, in that like the crux of community schools actually, and in particular for my job as the coordinator is to actually create systems and structures for this listening to happen and for those actions to take place, right? And so the crux of a community school is actually doing comprehensive hopes, needs and assets assessments. That's actually the crux of our school. That's how we listen, right? And what are the ways, I mean, there's a million different ways that we can do that, but two specific ways that we've done that have had transformational impacts is one, what we call coaching groups. It's a concept by Chris Emden. Um, he wrote a book called um, For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and for the rest of y'all too. Um, I think that's the whole name of the book. Um, but it's basically a focus group with young people around what, the, how they want to learn. So our seventh grade ELA teacher would do these lunchtime cogent groups, have kids come in and be like, okay, we're reading this novel. Would you rather do a lit circle or would you rather do this one other thing? And the students would be like, oh, we should definitely do a lit circle because A, B, C, D, and E, F, G. And she immediately imploded it the next day. And guess what happened? We saw results, right? So even like something like that, a cogent group. Um, is really, really impactful. Um, another thing that we're doing, launching piloting this year is we are doing um, what we're calling equity champions. We're going to train uh, families first to actually do instructional walkthroughs in classrooms and then be able to provide feedback to those exact teachers and to our leaders to be able to change our instructional practices. And these are families from the Bayview neighborhood these are Black families. We're going to train them. We're going to pay them to be able to improve our instructional practices and how we do schools, right? So there's a million different ways, but that's the crux. This question is gets to the crux of what community schools is, is for all of us to sit in a place of listening and then acting appropriately. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Lamont, um, for sharing those. And Steve, I know as someone who's for you, who's kind of been on like both sides of this community schools front, um, we know right now CDE has been listening and working in partnership with grassroots organizations to help inform the implementation of community school grants and engagement. Can you share what it looks like for CDE to work closely with community partners? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that question. And just, to, you know, just I think what it, what it needs to mean is listening um, to Eduardo, to Mr. Snare, to, to Ms. 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 Hu on, you know, just in the way that, you know, that what they've shared uh, today um, about really what is, you know, really what does transformational change look like for a school on the ground, but even more importantly, what does it feel like? What does it feel like when those relationships change? And I, 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 I couldn't ever be more, more eloquent than, than Lamont just was about how, you know, how we lens, you know, what lens through which do we see students? Do we see family members? Do we see kin? Do we see community? And, you know, and, and how also do we view assets? And through, through what biases do we screen what is an asset and what is a liability? And, and do we have the structures, uh, uh, as Leslie pointed out, for that critical self-reflection um, that is really necessary? Do we have the structures to have, you know, meaningful, um, participatory um, schools, not just in words, but in actual decisions. So, Khan, that doesn't answer your, your question, but it, it, it hopefully gets to what we're looking for. What we're, what, what is important is, is what we're, who we're listening to and what we're, what we're looking for um, as a foundation to then how do we work with grassroots community based organizations because look let, let's let's be direct because the stakes are high here we could say that we're doing a grassroots community listening tour and process and you know on paper show that we're doing that um what's important is that we actually get you know we actually do the listening and that the listening then informs the entire seven year implementation process, not just the applications, not just the entire process. Um, and so the specific ways that, that, that we're doing that are we're, we're doing um, a, a six and six process to start. Uh, we're holding six regional community forums uh, in partnership with um, uh, grassroots organizations, uh, parent and student-led organizations, uh, staff and teacher-led organizations throughout the state in different regions where the issues, the structural racism of the state education system is, 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 is I think, pretty, pretty clear in, in the outcomes that, that, and the disparities in the outcomes that, that we've known for, for decades. But the regional issues can sometimes be specific. And so it's important that we don't just do a statewide, but we, we go to six distinct regions throughout the, the state uh, virtually because of, of, of what, you know, we're, we're not out of, of, of the, the pandemic and, and certainly not out of the, the, the disparity and impacts of the pandemic. So there'll be six virtual um, uh, forums and uh, six site visits uh, to schools throughout the, the state where we do, um, where, where we do listening uh, sessions um, uh, with students, families, faculty, community-based organizations. Um, we are also, to be very transparent, we're also meeting with the LEAs, with the school districts who have implemented the first, uh, you know, the 20 pilot schools because we, it's important to learn from the district level as well. But we're being driven by the, the voices from uh, communities, from school sites, uh, youth, family, and, and teacher voice, which is I think where, where, we, where, where our listening needs to be most rooted. But I just wanna be clear, this is true for this initial process, but it must be true for the whole seven years. It can't just be, hey, 
or listening while we're coming up with this grant process. It's got to be. It's got to be through, throughout because you know if this, if you know, uh, Ms. Hu talked a little bit about outcomes and, and change in outcomes. Um, you know, I'm not somebody who, you know, is a believer in high stakes standardized tests or anything, anything like that. But we got to also change which, what's measured and how we measure. And, and when we do that through this community schools process, I, I think we'll, we'll see even more, more transformation. But I'll get, I'll get down from that particular soapbox car and, and, and thank you for the question. Oh, thank you, Steve. And, and you touched on the regional forms. And we know, again, this is like the grant program is like up, up to seven years or out to out to the vision is out to seven years. But we know that transformation right. is going to need to happen long beyond those seven years, too. And we want to make sure that student families are continuing to, to be part of this process. I want to revisit uh, the question that was in the chat from Angelica around, and this is for everyone in this space, maybe especially Lamont and Eduardo, if y'all have any insight. What are the structures that you found to be most effective to listen to young people and families? So I know, I know you mentioned the regional forums, but there's other things that folks felt like have worked well too. On who do you want to take that question? Anyone who wants to answer it. <laughs> well, I'll just say from, from my perspective that, um, you know, we're challenged by, 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 we're still challenged by the pandemic, but we're not limited by it. Um, I think it's also important to note that we are, um, we're, you know, there was a report that came out from the National Institute of Health um, about, about six weeks ago. And it said that 140,000 um, uh, children uh, throughout the country have lost their primary caregiver, um, the, the primary, care, and, and disproportionately um, students of color. Um, and that disproportionality is even more extreme um, in the Southwest, where, where we are in California. We pulled the numbers in California, it's close to 17,000 um, children have lost their primary caregiver. So the urgency of creating different models that, that, that Eduardo talked about are, are, I mean, it's just, it's, it's the most extreme that's ever been in my lifetime. Um, not just for the statistics that I just released, but for, for all of the testimony that, that, that Eduardo talked about, that Lamont and, and Leslie talked about. Um, and just, I just don't see, Karin, any substitute for listening sessions um, that are, that, that, th that are driven by and facilitated by students and family members themselves. Um, I, I think that is, for me, in my, that, that's been where, where the most authentic engagement happens, but I'll turn it to, to, to the panelists. If, if I can jump in here, there, there's two things that I would uh, call out. One, um, I want to just second that idea of listening campaigns, um, but I think the thing that's key about that is that um, you know you have a an equitable rotation of language facilitation, and what I mean by that is when typically when we go into meetings and they're facilitated in English and folks who speak non English languages are receiving translation, we have to do that differently in the way whereby folks who speak Spanish have the meeting facilitated in Spanish and everyone else is getting uh, translation or in Arabic at one meeting and you know other folks are getting so that so that there's not this elevation of the English language right so I think that's that's important when we talk about uh, listening campaigns the other thing that I'll highlight that that we saw worked in terms of you know, getting feedback um, and, and centering families is parent-teacher home visits. Those were really, really important because again, um, and, and I actually love to belabor the point of you know, this idea that we have to shift the power dynamic and having a teacher visit a parent's home um, and you know, just sit in that space and build with them on their terms 
right, in their uh, uh, sort of on, on their home field um, does a lot to help build relationships, but also, you know, help families to feel more comfortable sharing and feel like they are important in a school community. Thanks, Lamont. Um, Eduardo, I'm gonna throw it back to you uh, for this next question. Um, as California rolls out grants uh, for new community schools across the state, what values do you believe other districts should adopt as they develop new community schools? And what does that like real, meaningful, authentic student engagement and decision-making look like for young people? Great. So, you know, I really believe that the most important thing out of anything in terms of education and what really, what really uh, leverages how somebody succeeds, I really believe that it's, you know, health. The number one thing is always a person's health. You know, you look at it, especially in terms of right now, the pandemic, you know, at first, you know, parents were really scared. Like, should I, should I put my kids in school? Shouldn't I, you know? And when it was really hard, when COVID was really hit, really tough, we, you know, we, we, we just couldn't let that happen because so many people were passing away and people were going through a really tough time. But as you know, with the COVID, there's a lot of underlying health problems that are gonna have effects like long after, long effects after what, after the disease. So, you know, it's really important that the districts start looking towards always having a, a medical personnel at school. You know, as I mentioned before with Mendez, we have a new student health center and you know, the school's been around for almost 12 years, 10 years, and we've never had that. So when uh, somebody gets sick at our school, sometimes the nurse was only there once a week. And if somebody got really hurt, we had to call the ambulance. And there was a whole range of problems that it, it was just not manageable. But with having the student health center, if that could become widespread everywhere, that would really, really help a lot. You know, it, it also gives psychological services. As I mentioned that, you know, students really need to have a clear, clear mindset, a clear mentality on how they view life. And they gotta know how to control their emotions because that's literally the toughest thing that a teenager can go through is mental struggles. And if you give people the ability to have access to help for that, for counseling, for all those things, that that really that that could really change someone's life, really. And and you know an, another thing I want to note is that you know if you give students um, in, in terms of you know resources, funds that if you give them access to much more types of uh, courses, like I mentioned before about AP or electives, or even, you know, having funding for some extracurricular activities, that, that, that really also helps bring out somebody's, you know, inner ability to, to, to become, you know, who they wanna be. You know, like right now, me, I'm speaking here, I, I wouldn't be doing this like a couple years ago, you know, there was tough times, but, you know, through help and once we have these types of services, if they become more widespread, that could really help other people change their life. So, yeah. Thank you, Eduardo. And I know we're, we're getting close to time. Um, I did want to ask uh, Leslie really quick. Um, before we get to the closing question, we learned that the pandemic impacted students learning and social emotional needs. Can you share how community school models can address whole child supports? Can you share some of the unique and new needs that students are currently facing? Um, this is a really good question. I think that we're in a very unique time in our lives. Um, obviously like the, the trauma of the pandemic for students, plus the trauma for our educators, um, plus our trauma for our families, and the chronic 
underinvestment of our educator workforce really has brought us to this like perfect storm, right? Like I, you know, I, we, we've really struggled this year. We have less than 55 staff and there were days where we had more than 20 educators out with zero substitutes, right? And that is not a reflection of individual people, but it's a, it's a reflection of the chronic underinvestment of our public education, right? And so um, it's all come into this perfect storm and it's really impacted in some ways the innovative spirit that we've always had at my school. Um, but we are really excited to um, think about, like I wanted to be very intentional about two specific examples. Going back to when we first start, we closed school that Friday the 13th, I always remember, um, we were able, because we were a company school and we had that mindset, we mobilized our entire teachers, our entire staff to conduct family wellness calls within five business days because we knew that we were in this like really intense thing and we didn't want to lose that connection. So within a couple of weeks, we were able to reach on the phone 100% of our families to make sure that they knew that we had their back and that we were still here and that we were still supporting them in whatever way that we could. We were able to launch a GoFundMe within um within two days and we were able to raise $15,000 to be able to give gift cards to our families. Um, and that in turn actually served as a model for our entire district. And guess what happened? Now our entire district is conducting family wellness calls twice a year for all of our families. Um, and that is a structural change that because of the company school strategy, we were able to impact our entire city. Um, I think another really intentional thing that we've been able to do and we're going to start launching this year is that the basic needs of our families have not gone away. And so we've tried, we're going to try, we're very out of the box. So we're going to try, um, we've got a grant to do a kind of family resource center at our school. Um, where we're going to, um, we have some major goals. One major goal is to address some of the basic needs that our families still need, as well as some social emotional, but also especially for our, our young people who have been really dysregulated. I work at a middle school um, for 10 to 14 year olds and a lot of them are really dysregulated. What we're going to do is strategically pay our, some of our parents um, who are you know, struggling um, in this economy right now, but we're also gonna strategically have those families whose kids are really, who are really struggling with regulation and actually have them be working in their building to see if they can support their own children in being able to learn. We don't know how this is gonna work out, but this is the kind of innovative spirit that company schools are really uniquely positioned to try and tackle by do, having all these different needs converge into one idea. We're gonna pilot it, gather some data, see how it goes, especially for those families and those young people. Um, and the, this, these are the kind of things that I think that we can, we're serving our families' basic needs, as well as their children who might be struggling um, with their own mental health, all together in the building, working together with our community partners and families to, to really amplify and serve our young people. Um, and so these are some of the ideas that community schools are really famous for. Um, and I'm really proud of that. And that's something that I really hope that people are challenged by to rethink how we do school with this community school framework. Thank you, Leslie. And um, because of my poor time management skills, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the closing question. And I'm gonna ask if uh, each panelist can try to limit your answer to a minute or a minute and a half. And then we still have time. We can try to hit up some of these, uh, these questions from the, from the audience too. But the closing question is for, for everyone on this panel. As California releases the framework and grants for community schools across the state, what are some recommendations or values you want CDE and school districts to know that will lead to authentic, racially just community school models? I choose you, Lamont, to go first. Okay. I'll go. And um, with that, I'll just tell the story that sort of belabors, again, my point about the sharing of power. Um, after about four years of working on the design team, myself, my son, you know, many other families and uh, parents, my son was amongst the first group of kids that got caught cutting class. Um, 
And it was a very interesting moment because the principal called me and instead of saying the district requires that we suspend him, you know, she said, Lamont, how should we handle this for Ajane, my son? Um, and hence, how do we handle this for the school going forward, right? So that's a wholly different approach than, you know, um, most students receive, um, you know, and especially a group of black and brown boys receive in a situation like that. Typically, the idea is, you know, you, you cut class, you're suspended, or there's some, the book is thrown at you. Um, whereas, you know, they were able to do a restorative circle um, to talk about how that harmed you know, the school community and how it was harming them as well. And that, you know, basically it limited their desire to cut school um, or I should say cut class um, anymore. So I think just, you know, again, approaching it whereby everyone in the school community um, is an expert and has, you know, uh, investment in the community makes sense. Thanks, Lamont. And then again, uh, because we have to move quickly, I'm going to ask the rest of the panelists 30 seconds. Uh, Steve, you want to go next? Sure. I, you know, I, I think it, it is all about what the pan, what what my my fellow panelists have, have shared. It is about making sure that the that that the design teams, that the implementation teams, that that the decision making and the relationships are about this co-learning, about this 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 transformation of of power that can lead to the transformation of learning that is rooted in this embracing and and welcoming of the assets. And again, again to the, that lens, the assets that our students bring, our families bring, and that collectively. We can we can bring the type of change that um, that Eduardo has experienced at, at Mendes, um, the transformational experience that's led him to where I am right now, which is at Cal State. And I know he's uh, it's going to make us very very proud. So thanks, Karen. Thanks, Steve. We can go to Leslie, and then we're going to close out with you, Eduardo. Um, so I would say the number one value I think for for school districts and school communities is to lead with courage in anti racist principles. Um, and I think that is hard uh, in this climate, but I also think it demands courage um, to be able to do this work. I would also say that one of the things that I think that like um, that CDE and state of California can actually do is provide the infrastructural support for these school communities to engage in this work, right? To have school communities be able to be innovative, to be able to provide support so that we can actually listen to each other. Um, and these are the kind of big picture ideas to be able that school communities can grow their own community schools is to be able to create the space and infrastructure to support people to be able to listen to one another. Thanks, Leslie. Eduardo, you are closing us out. Right, so I, I really, you know, first off, yeah, I want to thank all of you for inviting me, but uh, I really want to note something really important is that we, we, all, we all value, really value our parents so much, you know, what they taught us, how they helped us grow as people. You know, my parents, I really thank them for everything they've done and you know I, I that that's really something we had to we always had to keep in mind that when we get the, the involvement of parents at schools you know when you, we do this in all the communities the, the voice of one person it will change another person but if we do it all as a community and if we have the support of our parents of people around around the country, we could really make a big impact. So I just want to note that. That was, that was beautiful, Eduardo. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to thank again all the panelists for taking the time out of your day to join us today. Uh, much appreciation to, to, to everyone and, and for the folks who are joining this panel. Um, we look forward to really building towards a transformative um, community schools in the next couple of years.